I think if nuclear were discovered today, it would be hailed as humanity's saving grace. Um, it's clean, it's baseload. There's never been a problem with the waste. It's a long lived asset. Uh, I mean, it really ticks basically all of the boxes. In my opinion, it, it is the answer. I don't think we can transition to a quote unquote green, quote unquote sustainable world with carbon free energy production, even looking out decades without nuclear. I just, I just don't see literally physically how it can be done. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. The global energy crisis is suddenly thrusting nuclear power into the spotlight. Most nations have spent the past decade plus working on mothballing or exiting their nuclear production facilities in the pursuit of migrating to a more green energy infrastructure. But now that strategy is being called into question as calls for more nuclear energy suddenly mount. Where is nuclear energy likely to head from here? Will we see more or less of it over the coming decades? And do the answers to these questions present opportunities for today's investors? To find out, we're fortunate to speak with Justin Hewn, founder and publisher of Uranium Insider. Justin, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. It's my pleasure, Adam. Thanks for having me on. All right, Justin, well, look, a lot of questions for you, some of them pretty specific, but let's start at a high level here. What's the current status of nuclear power in today's global energy mix? Currently, it's somewhere around 10 to 11% of total electricity generation globally. Um, importantly, it's about 30% of carbon free generation or low carbon generation, I should say. Um, it's set to grow as an energy source anywhere from 1% to 3% per year for the next couple of decades. That is likely to be on the higher side of that percentage growth as of the uh, the news flow over the past 12 months and more specifically over the past six months of um, a lot of countries re-embracing nuclear or, or embracing nuclear for the first time. So it is a growth sector as far as a percentage of the total grid, it's probably not growing as quickly because as you may or may not know, China continues, while they're building the most nuclear plants by far, they're also building about a coal, a, a coal plant every single week. Um, so there's uh, a lot of expansion in renewables, a lot of expansion in coal, and natural gas, along with nuclear. So it's percentage of as a total uh, percentage of the grid is probably not growing as quickly, but it is a growth sector. All right. It's, it's a growth sector. OK, um, you mentioned that China is building a lot uh, on a relative basis. Um, you know, for those of us in the West, uh, you know, the answer better than I. I don't know when the last. Uh, nuclear reactor was constructed in the U.S., but I think it was a while ago. And certainly reading the headlines about Europe, it seems like um, most countries in Europe are, you know, decommissioning uh, the nuclear reactors that they have there. So is this, is the growth of this predominantly coming from uh, non-Western countries? Um, as a percentage of the total, yes. So, for example, there's about 54, uh, fi somewhere around 50 to 55 reactors under construction currently globally, and China is 21 of those. There's a lot of reactors under construction in India. So most of the growth currently is coming, or I should say the majority. However, there's a lot of countries that are changing their tune on nuclear, and you mentioned in the EU. So um, one of the countries that has been uh, in the in the news lately has been Germany due to kind of the mess they've gotten themselves into with over reliance on Russian gas and they you know Germany spent over 500 billion dollars in the past uh, decade or so expanding renewables while shutting down their nuclear plants so they at one point had 17 operating nuclear plants and they have three remaining currently so along with Japan after Fukushima Germany was the primary country that had uh, decided to phase out nuclear and uh, a number of other countries in the EU did the same, but some of those countries are actually uh, changing their tunes. Switzerland is thinking about um, keeping their reactors online now. Belgium is thinking about keeping their reactors online. The, the UK is building new reactors. France has the large, the second uh, or the third, second largest, I think at this point, China's right on their heels, nuclear fleet in the world. And the nuclear makes up about 70% of their energy mix. They are wanting to build new, new reactors as well. 
So there's uh, there's a big upswell in interest. And of course, the global energy crisis and especially the European energy crisis is really putting a finer point on the importance of nuclear. OK, um, I, I want to dig more into sort of the reasons for uh, the, the decommissioning or, or at least sort of the lack of growth in nuclear in the West, because there are perceptions. And I'm curious to know how fundamentally based they are in terms of you know sort of the safety uh of of nuclear energy but before we get to that let's let's let, before we get to the con side of this ledger let's look at the pro sides of the ledger so what are the arguments in favor of nuclear energy uh i would say the the largest argument in favor of nuclear energy is that it's it's carbon free it's emissions free baseload power and that is a very unique type of electricity generation really the only emissions free baseload that we have besides nuclear would be uh hydro um, and to some extent geothermal, but that makes it such a small percentage of the total global energy mix. It, right. And for folks that don't understand what you mean when you say base load, can you just elaborate on that? 24-7 power, 24-7 yeah. power. It's not intermittent uh, like uh, solar or wind, for example. Yeah, so it's um, that's that's the biggest argument for nuclear. Um, there's so many other pros, though. It's a, it's a very long life asset. So uh, a nuclear power plant can operate, you know, some of the US uh, reactors are getting extensions to 80 years and they're considering extensions to up to 100 years of operation. So while one of the cons is the large sunk cost for the construction of the plant and the time it takes on average to construct the plants is much slower than let's say a natural gas plant or, or even renewables for that matter. But it's a very, very long lived asset. So you can have a nuclear plant running for 80 to 100 years base load with high high efficiency that's one of the other pros the the uh, operating uh, efficiency factor you know these things operate at at 80 to 90 percent uh, efficiency where you have solar and wind sometimes in the 20th percentile in terms of efficiency so it's really a highly efficient always on carbon free base load power it's very very reliable most people don't know this because there's so much fear and headlines around nuclear especially right now with the fighting in ukraine around the zaporizhia plant and you know fukushima fresh in people's memories and of course chernobyl uh, by far the worst uh, nuclear accident <clears throat> is in terms of peaceful nuclear um but nuclear actually is in terms of lives lost per kilowatt hour generated however you want to measure it the safest form of electricity generation that's ever been conceived <clears throat> and so most people don't know that it literally is has a, a very very safe record in terms of its uh, uh accidents that have happened versus the amount of generate uh electricity that's generated so it's very safe it's always on it's clean uh gosh i'm sure i'm missing some points here but those are those are the big ones the base load carbon free um and always on it's it's really that's the biggest benefit of nuclear in my opinion all right so great list there um i i want to i want to dig into just one to make sure i i understand it correctly um it, it is i want to say it's 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 cheap energy once it's up and running you said there's a there's a big sunk cost uh of, of getting these things uh you know built and they, they they take years to build and because of the safety issues and and probably just because of the expertise that's needed to create something that's that's so sophisticated uh big upfront cost but once it's actually up and running and the cost has been sunk in it um the, the I'm a, I believe the power generation is relatively cheap on a going forward basis is that accurate it is yeah and it um and oftentimes finds itself not at the bottom of these of these price charts when comparing to other types of electricity generation but most of the time that has to do with uh, either a history of very cheap natural gas, especially in the United States. That's not so the case in Japan or Europe, but um, also the cost of renewables has been not only highly subsidized, but it's been in a way subsidized due to the manufacturing of solar panels, almost entirely coming from China, that has um, obviously very low, if any, environmental regulations and cheap, if not slave labor. Um, so the the cost that you're offsetting due to those factors and comparing to nuclear isn't really an apples to apples comparison. The other type of comparison that often happens having to do with nuclear versus renewables has to do with the fact that renewables aren't even always on. So they're comparing nuclear 
at a cost per, let's say, kilowatt hour generated compared to solar, <clears throat> but they're not factoring in that solar is not producing energy for about 14, 15 hours out of the day. Uh, so they're just taking the capacity factor without without factoring in the actual percentage of efficiency of that generation. So when you factor in actual levelized cost of electricity, nuclear is amongst the lowest, if not the lowest. Okay. Okay. All right. And then the last question, you talked about these, these plants being very long lived and in, in certain cases, they're at least in the U S they're extending the lifetimes out to 80, maybe even hundred years. What is the current age of the oldest reactor in the U S? Mm, that's a great question. I actually don't know off the top of my head. Um, I think that some of the reactors that were built in the 60s, I believe, are still operating. So what would that be? That would be about 60 years. I think they're pushing around that time frame. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I'm just curious, in case, in case you know it, you know, what would you guess to be sort of the average age of a reactor in the US? Probably in the in the 50s. In the 50s. Okay. Yeah. So for the the the, the, <laughs> uh, the fleet we have right now, we probably have another 30 years ish out of it, maybe even longer if they get extended. Yeah, actually, you know, most of the reactors that were built in the States were built in the 80s. So we're probably in the 40s, let's say 40s to, to early 50s would probably be the bulk of the fleet. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, in the next 10 years or so, about 30% of the US fleet is set to be uh, brought offline. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. If they don't get life extensions. Time? If they don't get life extensions. And about 30% of, of, of the US fleet, which is the largest fleet in the world, uh, yeah. 92 operating reactors. About So about 30 of those are set to come offline in the next decade if they don't get life extensions. If they don't get life extensions. Okay. And you and I are talking, uh, we both are in California. And California's, I believe, only operational nuclear plant right now is... Uh, being highly debated whether it should be I, I think it's on track to be shut down unless uh they change the plan but there's a lot of debate about changing the plan is that true they actually just voted on it last week and they're extending it at least five years out to 2030 okay so yeah so literally got a reprieve from the governor yes <laughs> um, yes well it, we'll it went happens. to a legislative vote and the democrat supermajority in california voted to extend it now i'm sure that they got nudged by gavin newsom who who wanted to keep it online probably for his own political reasoning. But either way, there was a lot of advocacy work that went into that, keeping that plant online. And it's it's uh, somewhere around 10% of the entire grid for the state. So it's absolutely crucial. I mean, I got a notification this morning saying there's, uh, maybe you got the same being in California, saying there's a, a high likelihood of rolling blackouts in the state today between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. and to try to conserve energy. Uh, so it was a no brainer to keep it online, but still a huge, huge victory because that it's, you know, the plant is running absolutely perfectly. Um, and I recently visited San Luis Obispo a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> and it was interesting. The day that I was there, PG&E was actually testing the siren system in the town for if there were an accident. And so that was going on in the background right when I arrived. And I was talking to this local shop person and asked him, you know, how, how do you feel about Diablo Canyon? And what's the local sentiment? And he's like, oh, everybody wants to keep it online. They, they know their energy costs are going to skyrocket if they close it. So good news on that front all right well well and i don't want to get yet to the point of good or bad but but uh it seems like this is a sign of things to come which is sort of when push comes to shove given sort of the mounting energy issues that we're seeing uh it's becoming a much more complicated decision to shut down these plants much more so than it was probably five ten years ago in people's minds definitely yeah and a couple of other points on the u.s front you know there's Recently, the, with the Inflation Reduction Act, there was $30 billion that was allocated towards nuclear uh, production tax credits. And so, uh, you know, a quick analysis of this amount of funding is basically those 30-ish reactors that are set to come offline in the next 10 years or so. Um, that's enough money, technically speaking, uh, with a back of the napkin analysis to keep all of those plants online. And one of the plants that shut this year, the Palisades reactor in Michigan, that shut down about two and a half months ago. The operator of that plant, which I believe is Holtec, that that closed that plant down or decided to decommission it, is now saying they want to bring it back online because of these tax credits. So it's a big it's a big shift um, in recognizing the value of nuclear, and unfortunately, it took an energy crisis to to highlight it. That that's really interesting. So um, the the Build Back Better legislation um, that was proposed earlier. Uh, didn't pass uh, through Congress. Um, now, a lot of that's been rolled into this Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the whole part of, of sort of build back better, as I understood it, was to, you know, build a, a green energy grid, right, help help wean us off fossil fuels. Um, 
And if it sounds like you're saying there's billions inside of this, this new Inflation Reduction Act to incentivize nuclear production. So I'm, I'm leapfrogging to a question I was going to ask later in this conversation, but is, is nuclear now becoming, you know, is the transition of perceiving nuclear as a green energy source underway here? It definitely seems so. Um, this is not something I would have dreamt of three or four years ago, you know, first entering this trade for myself in, in 2017. This is not something that, that was on anyone's bingo card to have a, a complete shift amongst especially kind of the environmental left, which a certain percentage of those folks are still against nuclear. But um, to actually have it have it be embraced by in, bipartisan in the United States is huge. And recently this year, nuclear was included in the green EU taxonomy. So, and that's for the first time ever. So this is basically a, um, a, a system of, of judging different sources of energy and allocating funds uh, towards these sources of energy that are considered green. And they also included gas, but they, I, in my opinion, they included gas because some of the countries would not have gone along with it if gas is not included uh, because nuclear was included. So there were, you know, Austria and Spain and Germany, I think were against nuclear being included, but for the most part, the EU was a uh, majority in favor of nuclear's inclusion in the green taxonomy. So um, that that's a significant sentiment signal in my opinion. Okay. Um, I want to earmark this because <laughs> yes, it sounds like there could be a, a very substantial sentiment shift here from more or less nuclear bad um, we're gonna we're gonna wean ourselves off it to now. Hey, nuclear may be a key part of the future. Um, but before we get to that, we talked about the pro, uh, pros. Let's now talk about the cons, or at least the perceived cons, of nuclear. So um, they largely there may be more than than just this, but um, you know, in most people's minds, they think of uh, the risk of a nuclear, uh, you know. A horrible, new, a catastrophic nuclear accident. You mentioned a few: Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima, et cetera. Um, and then there's the issue of what to do with all the radioactive waste. Um, and so let's let's address those two, and then any others you think should be added to that list. Well, those two you just mentioned are by far the biggest uh, opposing points for those who who question nuclear or against nuclear. Um, you know, right now there's there's fighting going on around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine. And this is a massive power plant. There's six reactors. I believe it's 5,600 megawatts. It's a monster. It's the largest in Europe. Um, it's 25 to 30% of the grid in Ukraine. It's an absolutely key pivotal uh, pivotal piece of, of real estate for either side. And Russia wants to control it. And right now they are controlling it. Um, Ukraine's putting up a fight about it. So, but you've seen a lot of fearful headlines around this and I don't want to minimize, um, you know, what's going on there really, but, you know, you have Erdogan from, you know, Turkey coming out and saying, you guys got to, you got to cut this out, uh, Russia. We don't want Chernobyl part two, you know, blanketing Europe and radiation. And that absolutely is not going to happen. So Chernobyl had no, uh, containment dome over the reactor core. There are no operating reactors right now that do not have a containment dome. So the whole idea with a containment dome is it's two meters of solid concrete that surround the reactor core so that not only to protect it from outside influence, like right now, all the fighting that's going on the plant, in my opinion, that fact that we've seen almost nonstop fighting around and nearby this nuclear power plant for the last four or five months, and it continues to operate is a testament to its robustness. But, you know, these things, these containment domes are built to withstand a, a jetliner crashing into the side of it. Um, so that's one thing to protect this reactor core from outside damage, but also to protect if there is a meltdown within the reactor core, the containment dome contains the radiation. So uh, most of the time, you know, if something like this were to happen, the, the the chance of a nuke of a Chernobyl part two is basically not on the table. So when you see headlines of the plant could explode and, and blanket Europe and radiation, that basically is impossible because of these containment domes. Um, so yes, Chernobyl was bad. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, putting frosting on that one, but um, that happening again is basically not on the table. So the in the safety record for reactors since Chernobyl, including Fukushima, 
including Three Mile Island. So these are the other big accidents that are, and I put quotes because Three Mile Island, basically the containment dome did exactly what it's supposed to. And there was no um, heightened radiation that leaked out of that plant. There was still a lot of fear around it. Um, and Fukushima was a little bit more of a, of a considerable meltdown, but uh, most of the radi radiation was contained and nobody died from Fukushima. Not a single person lost their lives due to radiation from that. So the, the accident fear, in my opinion, is largely overstated, but it's there. I mean, it's there. You can't deny it, right? There's always a chance of something bad happening, but the fact that there's such a robust safety record for global reactors, I mean, there's 450 reactors operating right now in the world. It's, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of these things and they're operating with high efficiency and, and great safety records. Um, as far as the waste goes, that also, in my opinion, is overstated, but the waste does exist, right? So, and it and it stays radioactive for a very, very, very long time. We're talking, you know, 100,000 years is somewhat radioactive before it really dissipates. Um, and in the United States, the waste is stored at each reactor's facility. And it's stored in these casks that are solid concrete and steel. We've never, ever had an accident with nuclear waste, not one. And various countries are doing different things with them. So for example, in Finland, they have an underground repository and there's a number of other countries as well that are doing the same thing. This is uh, very intelligently designed based on ideal geology. These casts are brought underground. They are buried in clay and covered over in concrete and they work their way down, work their way back up to the surface uh, to store all of their waste. But the amount of waste is very, very small. So for example, if, if you were to have all of your lifetime's electricity usage come from exclusively nuclear for an average life, 75 to 80 years, all of your electricity came from nuclear, the amount of waste would fit inside a uh, Coke can. Um, all of the nuclear generation in the United States history, starting in the 50s, leading up till now, all of the waste that has been produced in the United States fits on a football field about 30 feet high. So it's a very, very small amount of waste and it really isn't a problem. So what about the waste problem? That question is, is, uh, is misinformed. The waste really isn't a problem. And you also have uh, countries like France actually recycling some of it. So they have a process called mixed oxide. It's MOX fuel where they, they take the, the nuclear waste, the plutonium, and they go through a complex chemical process and they can actually reuse the waste in a percentage of their fleet that has been designed for that. The Japanese do that a little bit as well. Um, and then there's there's new technologies that, you know, some, some folks who are very, very familiar with the new advanced reactor technologies and new technologies of recycling waste are basically saying, why are these people burying this for the long term? We will eventually be able to utilize this waste for future reactor fuel. So there's, there's a lot of uh, promise around utilizing waste going forward. Okay, great. So that's heading into the next question I was going to ask, which is the current answers you or the answers you've given are largely based upon current technology. And as you mentioned earlier, at least in the US, you know, our average age of our fleet is 40 years uh, old already. So, you know, technology has moved on since then. Um, is there the opportunity to do things better going forward, given the advances in technology? And I've got some questions around reactors, but why don't we get to the, the, the waste parts first, since we're, you were just talking about that. So it sounds like you're saying um, uh, you have this radioactive waste. Um, there exists some current potential uh, ex you know, with existing technologies to reuse at least some of that waste, right? The MUX uh process you were talking about. Um, <clears throat> but how, how promising is it looking at the, the new technologies? Uh, like, What are they indicating to us? Um, will we, do we see a pathway to where we could be using 100% of the waste uh, and recycling that? Or is it more like half or 30%? What, 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 what is technology promising us right now? That's a good question. And I don't really have a perfect answer for that because I don't really know exactly the technologies around recycling waste, but I do know that technologies exist currently and they've been around for a while. Like I said, the French utilize a decent amount of MOX fuel um, as well as the Japanese, but going forward, they're definitely, uh, they definitely are working on being able to recycle the waste. And some of the, a lot of the advanced reactor technology that I'm more familiar with than let's say waste reprocessing 
has to do with efficiencies and has to do with uh, many years of operation without having to refuel. Um, a lot of these advanced reactors designs, these SMRs, these small modular reactors that are, there's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of, of really unbelievably brilliant designs around these things, um, where they're basically meltdown proof. Uh, these reactors, uh, there's some designs that have solid core that they don't even need uh, water or gas or any type of molten salt or anything like that to, to keep the reactor uh, core cool. Um, they can operate without uh, human involvement. So if something were to happen where somebody, you know, we're not and one of the operators didn't show up to work or whatever it might be, um, the reactor can operate without human intervention. I mean, there's brilliant, brilliant designs. And uh, some of those designs have much less waste. Um, some of them, I believe, are working on uh, the ability to recycle that waste. So, you know, to answer that question, really to start off is the waste isn't a problem. I mean, that's really the short answer to all of this. The waste is not a problem. All right. The fact well, that it remains radioactive, it's highly, highly regulated. Um, and there's never been an accident with it. All right. Well, let, let's, let's, there are going to be some people who aren't going to be able to go there yet in their minds. And so let, 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 let's go to the nightmare scenario, which is um, we bury a bunch of waste. We, you know, wherever we can put it under a mountain and a mine, you know, whatever. Um, and whatever containment is in there cracks. All right, so you've got this leaking radioactive waste that's however deep in the earth. What's the danger there? There's no danger, basically. I mean, it's it's so unlikely for that scenario to happen. If you have a single cask of uh, nuclear waste that's buried underground that cracks, I mean, there's going to be zero radiation uh, on the surface of the earth. So it's, I mean, it's not an ideal situation, but, um, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch when we're talking about um, all of the fossil fuel types of, of energy generation. I mean, I think you really have to look at it at a relative basis. All the fossil fuel energy generation, the waste is in your lungs. It's in the air. It's in the ocean. Look at renewables. You know, the, the solar panels have heavy metals, have mercury that are being buried in landfills after, you know, 15, right. 20 years of usage. And the chemicals in those fracking pits. I mean, it's, it's, it's totally giving it to you that all the other, hydro, all the other energy sources have all their, their hydro is clean. I mean, if you look at everything through the myopia of carbon, then, then hydro looks fantastic. Look at what's happened in China with some of these, the dam constructions and the failures. I mean, to dam a river is ecologically devastating, not even looking at the human impact. And nobody talks about this because all we're looking at is carbon. And I think it's such an absurd lens to view anything through. But with that said, I think all things considered, the fact that we have a tiny amount of nuclear waste that's somewhat radioactive for a very long time, safely stored, we've never had an accident with it. That, in my opinion, is a trade-off I'm willing to accept compared with the other downsides. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to dig at this just a little bit more, and then we're going Please. to go to the reactor side of things. So right now, we are storing, I'm going to say in the US, I know less about other countries, uh, but as I understand it, we are storing the radioactive waste at kind of each, you know, near each reactor, right? right. Each, each state that's got its own reactors is kind of dealing with its own waste management. And... Um, you know, I have heard some scary stories about, oh, you know, the, this state has been underfunding, you know, the storage facility and they're finding, you know, cracks or rust or whatever, right? And and I'm sure it's, you know, local mileage varies in the story. Some are doing it great, some are doing it not so great. Um, <clears throat> we had the, we have had the proposal at the, the national level to basically take all of that waste and store it underground at Yucca Mountain and, um, Essentially, I'm assuming that is taking kind of the nation's football field size of, of collective waste and putting it somewhere that's as safe and remote as we can can think to. Now, it's been there's been a lot of political resistance there, right, for a lot of these fears that we've been talking about. Um, first off, do you think the Yucca Mountain solution is the sensible one in the U.S.? I suppose. I mean, the, the, the way that it's being stored right now hasn't really presented any problems, um, but to centralize that and to do it, I mean, if we don't find a way in the States that is economical to recycle the waste, like the French are doing, um, I suppose the safest way to deal with it is to place it in a remote area and bury it underground, like, like the Finns are doing. Um, that seems like a reasonable solution. Okay. That seems like a reasonable solution. And, um, it, it, so my next question on this is, is, Let's say we do that. We have literally all of the radioactive waste in the U.S. all in one place. 
what's the worst that could happen there? Do you think when you put on your nightmare hat? I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, and I'll use Zaporizhia as an example that they're saying there's concerns of, okay, what if, what if Russia just bombs the plant shells, the plant to create a nuclear event? It's like Russia has nuclear weapons. I mean, why would they, why would they do this? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So if you're, I mean, the worst nightmare scenario would be that the, that the, the the repository would somehow be compromised by nefarious actions but it just seems like such a far-fetched endeavor um especially considering how regulated the nuclear waste is even right now so these you know it has to be that has to be dealt with in a specific way and this is monitored by the iaea and this is and and the nrc in the in the united states the nuclear regulatory commission so it's not something that's just you know thrown in a bucket and tossed in the backyard i mean this is highly highly regulated and we've never ever had a problem with it so um for it to be buried underground in a remote area i i don't really envision what a problem could be i mean these it's really um it's a it's a far-fetched idea to to even think about something nefarious happening there when that same type of bad actor hypothetically could do something far worse um, just with, with a whole nother type of like, if, if you're talking about, I mean, I don't even know how to answer this question. I can't even imagine a situation. You're taking something that's sitting on the surface in a cask right now that has zero problems whatsoever. And you're burying it 300 meters in the ground. Like what could happen to it? I don't even right, know. Like un, un, under a mountain. Yeah. And the reason, so the yeah. reason why I'm digging at this is to try to, you know, kind of mm -hmm. do the intellectual exercise of, sure. okay, we all have this fear, but is it a rational fear? And, and here's the analogy. Um, my big phobia is sharks. That's the recurring nightmare I have, you know, when I wake up in the morning in a cold sweat. And, I'm with uh, you on that one. <laughs> and, and when I go in the water, when I go to the ocean, that's in my brain. Hey, there's sharks in there, right? Now, uh, recently, uh, it's somebody put out on the internet a GIF of all the ways you could die and the probability of each, Right. And shark attacks is literally the lowest one on there. So it's 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 a very present phobia of mine, but it's a very irrational one when it's given the the, the risk factor that's truly involved, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so uh, so this may be an example of that where you know we all are understandably freaked out by the thoughts of you know uh, contaminated waste getting out into the system uh, that's this highly radioactive, but the the probability seems to be extremely low and to your point when you sort of you know measure me measure the expected uh you know uh human slash environmental cost of this it's actually probably very low on a relative basis to the other solutions we're already using in terms of the human you know death or illness cost and the environmental cost and whatnot um all right so enough about waste let's move on to the reactors themselves so you 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 did mention um that there are uh, at least models out there. I don't, I don't know if any exist in the real world, so please enlighten us. Um, but for different types of nuclear reactors that we have right now, the ones that we at least have in the States here, as I understand, they're big. Uh, they require a lot of cooling. So they usually have to be, you know, located by a river or whatnot, have tons of water going in there. Uh, you, you have to have staff there all the time and just making sure that the core doesn't go into meltdown because that's when all the really big dangers happen. Uh, you have this this new model out there. Uh, I'm sure there are many, but but the one we hear a lot about are SMRs, uh, small mod modular reactors, which are basically smaller nuclear plants that a present um, a, a much smaller risk in terms of hey, if the core should melt down, it's not going to do nearly as much damage as as the current bigger ones. Um, they obviously require a lot less water, and, and they have a much smaller environmental footprint. Um, but but there's also models that would run on different types of fuel. You even gave a little nod to this. You know um, what I've heard with the molten salt potential reactors um, is, hey, if there ever were a core meltdown, the molten salt would just fall off, fall out. Then it would it would cool, and you could literally go pick it up and just fix the reactor, put it back in, melt it down again, and, and you're back off to the races. There's no no need to kind of like you know cordon the area off for, for you know, years after that. Um, and you even mentioned some solid state solutions. So if you could just kind of dial through what the current technology is promising on that end and, and, and answer the question, why aren't we building this stuff? Even just 
a couple, you know, operational ones just to prove that it works. So in case we want to do it, we've, we've got a working prototype to follow. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is probably the most exciting area of nuclear right now is these quote unquote advanced reactors and especially the small modular reactors that have various designs. A lot of them are designed to use what's known as HALU or high assay, low enriched uranium. Basically, middle enriched uranium is a better way to put it. Uh, so reactors currently, most of them are light water reactors, the large reactors in the world, and they use uh, they use fuel that's that's enriched to about four and a half percent, roughly four and a half percent U two thirty five, the fissile isotope, and natural uranium has 0.7 percent. So that's that's why it has to be enriched to get more of the fissile stuff into the actual uh, nuclear fuel. Um, the the high assay low enriched uranium can be enriched up to twenty percent, and so what that allows that that allows for higher efficiency within the reactor core that allows for a longer period of time between refueling. So some of these SMRs can go up to 20 years without needing to shut down and refuel, which is huge. So right now, you know, all these, these sorry, large- re re sure. Refuel means just putting new rods in that are- Exactly. Back exactly. up to the enrichment standard, okay. Correct, yeah. So right now, you know, the average light water reactor will have to go through a refueling outage around every 18 months, 12 to 18 months. And typically what happens is a, a third, a quarter to a third of the core is replaced with fresh fuel. Um, and that third that comes out goes into uh, these cooling pools and the, it's there for a number of years. And then it goes into uh, long-term storage in these, in these cement and steel casks that we've talked about. So the SMRs that use HALU, they could be operating for many, many years beyond the average uh, 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 refueling that happens right now for large reactors. Um, gosh, there's so many cool designs. Okay, so, and we are building them by the way. So China is currently building one right now. Um, in the United States, we have something called Idaho National Labs, which is where various nuclear innovations are, uh, prototypes are built and they're tested out. And this, uh, right now, there's a number of SMR designs that are going through the prototype phase in the Idaho National Labs. So there's this one design that is uh, set to be built in Wyoming, in the state of Wyoming. And this is the, uh, ter uh, ter is it TerraPower? Um, I'm forgetting the company, but the reactor is called a natrium reactor. Okay. Um, I think it's the one that's going to be near Jackson Hole. You know, I don't know exactly where it is in the state. I apologize. I know it's happening okay. in Wyoming. It's possible. Yeah. So it's set to replace a coal plant in Wyoming. And this is TerraPower's, it is TerraPower, their nature and reactor. It's, I believe, 370 megawatts. So the average, on average, large light water reactor is around 1,000 megawatts. So it's about the third of the size in terms of electricity output. And this particular reactor, can take excess heat from the uh, from the energy generation you know reactor process and store that in molten salt and it can actually pull the heat energy from that molten salt storage and ramp up the electricity production significantly from 370 megawatts up to 500 megawatts and can do that for 4 to 5 hours at a time and this is really cool because one of the downsides to nuclear let's say is the its ability to quickly and drastically ramp production up and down so it can cycle up and down you know 10% maybe 20% and it can do so but it, the reactor you know operators don't really like to cycle the energy output uh, so drastically and so quickly and one of the obvious reasons that, that they would be doing this would be to buffer the uh the instability of the grid that comes from renewables so if there's a lot of renewables as a part of the grid like in germany Basically, you need to have a baseload energy source that can cycle up and down easily, which is why, ironically, Germany expanding renewables so drastically, it's also had to expand natural gas and coal power and biomass, by the way. So Germany's biomass, which they consider green, is burning wood pellets from trees being cut down in Arkansas and shipped across the ocean. That's their green energy. Uh, but I won't go down that road right now. So basically, um, so the Natrium Reactor is a really brilliant design. Uh, there's a company called New Scale. They're actually publicly traded. They have uh, a reactor called the Voyager, and that's actually a light water reactor, just a much smaller one. I think it's 77 megawatts. And they actually have NRC approval for this design. So uh, kind of some first mover advantage there. But there's uh, about a dozen of prototypes that are somewhere along that process of, of being built at the Idaho National Labs right now. And there's, you see almost, you see a piece of news about some, uh, whether it's Rolls-Royce, they're building SMRs, GE Hitachi, uh, TerraPower, uh, New Scale. I mean, there's, there's dozens of these companies, most of them private, 
that are signing uh, MOUs, that are signing signing uh, letters of intent with various companies in various countries around the world. It's a really, really exciting space uh, going forward, especially into the 2030s. But the TerraPower Nature Reactor in Wyoming, they are hoping to have approvals and construction permits by 2025 with the actual SMR uh, operating by 2027, 2028. And the big thing with SMRs, and I know that's that's wishful thinking for new technology. So the fact that if that actually happens on time, I'd be very surprised. But that's the United States. So if we go to other countries, you know, nuclear can happen on time and on budget. Like in China, the 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 um, the Baraka plant in UAE was built by the South Koreans, and they blasted that thing out. I think it was done in five years, and it was on budget. So, and that's a big one. But the SMRs can be built um modularly so it can be implemented into a smaller grid they can be constructed at a central facility and shipped to the place of energy generation and that's the big the the factory construction uh of the these types of reactors is really the big change that could allow for these to be mass produced yeah so just on that from what i've heard talking to previous nuclear experts is that at least in the states um it seems that every nuclear plant that's been built has kind of been a one-off to a certain extent. Um, it has its own unique design. The labor force that they've recruited to do it is largely doing it all for the first time. Um, and so you don't get economies of scale and production and uh, you have all these, you know, heterogeneous, uh, you know, sort of policies at each one because everything is different and unique. Whereas these small modular reactors, um, you get all the benefits you were just talking, you know, from the physics of them all, but you also get the, you know, hey, if we're banging these out the same way all at the same time, well, we get lots of benefits of scale from that. We get cost efficiencies, we get speed efficiencies, we get standardization efficiencies, et cetera. I see you nodding as I'm saying all this. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's a really important point with SMRs. And that generally is true with regards to larger reactors, um, with some exceptions. China is one of them, obviously. You know, they're they're building uh kind of fleet mode with these Hualong one reactors, these large reactors, pressurized water reactors, and they built uh, many of these, and there's many more to come. So they've kind of uh fleet moded that particular design, let's say. Um, but yes, that's a huge, huge potential advantage for SMRs is to be able to build. Um, to, to build the parts for these reactors and uh, and to ship them out and assemble them in place. That's a, a really, really big a potential benefit going forward for, for being able to expand nuclear. And the fact that these SMRs are, they're anywhere from one or two megawatts up to three, 400 megawatts and everywhere in between. So varying designs can be implemented in varying different areas. It's not like, okay, we only have, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 megawatt monstrous reactors that have to, they can only be placed in, into grids of uh, a certain size that can accept that amount of energy. But with SMRs, you know, New Scale's 77 megawatt uh, uh, Voyager reactor, and they can, they can link up to 12 of those together. So you can really expand on that and grow. And there's huge, there's amazing potential uses for them. I mean, with shipping, it could potentially replace diesel fuel for large shipping. Um, I mean, they're already using SMRs and have been for decades in, uh, you know, the nuclear, submarines. yeah, nuclear submarines. So it's a really, really exciting. Honestly, I think SMRs combined with uh, desalination is is a is such a such a huge potential benefit, especially for areas that are stricken with drought, like California currently. Um, so, a lot of excitement and and uh, innovation in that space happening right now. All right, great. Well, look, I want to get in just a minute to the um, the opportunity here uh, for investors, because obviously. Uh, you know, we're getting a, you know, masterclass right now in the essentiality of energy to the world economy, uh, given the, the world energy crisis and uh, a, a, a material advancing solution like this, there's probably going to be, you know, lots of value to be, be claimed if indeed we go this way. Um, so I want to talk about that in just a minute here. Um, uh, if we can real quickly, can we just talk about uranium itself? Of the course. actual element, um, sure. and uh, uh, you know, you you call your newsletter there Uranium Insider. Um, I, I, I think there's well, I, I know that there's 
you know, some potential out there to, to have other different types of, of nuclear material as well, besides just uranium based ones. And maybe we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, if you could just sort of demystify for folks that that uranium is just something they vaguely remember from the the uh, periodic chart of elements uh, from their high school chemistry class. Um, what exactly is it and, and, and why is it so essential to today's nuclear power? Sure. Um, uranium is a metal. It's um, it's highly abundant in the Earth's crust. It's basically everywhere. Uh, it's just not super high grade everywhere. Um, there's actually a lot of uranium in the hills in my backyard here in Southern California uh, that will probably never be mined. And that's probably a good thing in this particular area. Um, it's highly, highly abundant. It, uh, Like I mentioned earlier, it has three primary isotopes. Uh, U-235, U-238, and U-234. And U-2 the U-235 isotope is the one that's actually fissile. Um, nuclear was discovered, uh, at least the fission of nuclear, I believe, was discover discovered in the early 1900s. And it really, um, I mean, it was the Manhattan Project the, to, to build the nuclear bomb that really led to the peaceful use of nuclear. Uh, later on in the in the 50s when they started designing for um, for actual energy generation. It's um, it, you know, nuclear is it's such a fantastic, uh, highly, highly concentrated form of energy. And so, you know, one uranium pellet that's about the size of a gummy bear has the same amount of potential energy as, uh, as I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it's something like 100,000 tons of coal. Um, it's, it's an unbelievably concentrated form of energy. And in order for it to be fissile sufficient enough to create enough heat to boil water and spin a turbine and create electricity, that fissile isotope has to be um, has to be enriched. And so over the years, this process has been um, refined to the point where we have a, uh, a fuel cycle that at this point is pretty darn efficient. And uh, it's, it's quite complex to understand. And that's one of the big goals of our newsletter that I think we do a decent job of is breaking down the unbelievably complex uh, elements of the fuel cycle and into an understanding of what that means for supply and demand going forward and why we believe we will see much higher prices for uranium. Uranium is already up from the lows significantly, a bottom at $18 a pound in 2016. And it's sitting, and the spot price of uranium is sitting right around $50 a pound right now. So it's already up significantly from the lows, which doesn't happen in an oversupplied market, by the way. Um, and so, Basically, the fuel cycle, I mean, if you want me to run through this, I can do so relatively quickly without getting too geeky with it. Uh, maybe just the 60-second version. 60-second version. All right. So it's mined out of the ground in various ways. Underground mining, hard rock mining, like you see in Canada and Saskatchewan, you know, the Cigar Lake, the MacArthur River mines. These are very, very high grades. We're talking, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent uh, uranium. That's very, very high. And you only see those grades really in Canada. Uh, you have open pit mining that you'll see. Um, some of that happened in the past in Canada. Uh, you see that mostly in Africa and Australia, in Namibia and Niger um, and in Western Australia. And then you have ISR mining in situ recovery, which is how it's mined in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, the United States. It, ha it needs a specific geology. You inject a uh, lixivian, a fluid into the ground, into an aquifer, and you extract it. And then that lixivian interacts with the mineral and binds to the uranium they can pull out of the ground. Highly efficient relative to underground open pit mining, which is why the Kazakhs have kind of a perfect storm of geology and, and decent grades. Uh, they produce 40% of the world's uranium, uh, almost 60 million pounds a year. So that mined uranium goes through a, a very simple process to turn it into U308, uranium octoxide. That is the yellow cake. That's the, the barrels of yellow cake, and that's just considered uranium in, in terms of the fuel cycle. It has to be converted to a gas in order to be enriched. So that goes through a process to convert it to a, a fluorinating process to convert it to uranium hexafluoride or UF6. That's known as natural uranium in the fuel cycle. So UF6 gets enriched by being spun in a centrifuge. The U235 and U238 isotopes have a very slight difference in mass so the centrifuge spinning separates those isotopes, enriches from 0.7% U-235 up to, I mentioned earlier, about 4.5%. That enriched UF-6 then um, gets deconverted 
back into a solid form and it gets fabricated into fuel rods that are specific to a reactor's design. That's the fuel cycle in a nutshell. All right. Well, you did a great job of saying that and uh, explaining that in a very short period of time. I very much appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. So <laughs> you talked about where it comes from. Um, so as a, as a fuel source, um, how plentiful is it? And um, are there any supply concerns as we move into the future, either because the world really embraces nuclear and all of a sudden demand from uranium gets much larger, uh, but also you mentioned that 40% of the world supply comes from Kazakhstan, which isn't all that far away right now from, you know, the tensions that are going on between the West and Russia as, or, you know, if that were to get compromised, would that be an issue for, uh, for the West? Um, what, what's happening on the supply side? Sure. Um, well, generally speaking, there's no shortage of uranium. There's a lot of uranium. There's uranium in seawater. It's very, very low concentrations. And at this point, it's un, uh, it's not profitable to extract it from seawater, but that technology is being worked on. And that likely will be a way to mine uranium going forward. There's technologies for laser enrichment that will be able to enrich uh, the abundance of tails material from uh, various enrichers around the world. That might come on later part of the decade um, there's a lot of uranium in Australia. There's a lot of uranium in the United States. Um, it's like I said, it's very, very abundant. It's just a matter of the cost structure to support uh, mining it or extracting it from various places. There's a ton of uranium and phosphate tails. Uh, it's just too expensive to get it out at this point and doesn't, you can't justify it with the current cost of uranium. So let's say hypothetically uranium or nuclear energy is re-embraced and these growth rates we're talking about two, 3% per year happens out in the next couple of decades, there will be no shortage of the actual uranium. It's just a matter of the cost uh, of, the, of the, the price of uranium to justify the mines. And that's one of the big kind of, uh, you know, short thesis statements for why uh, I think the investment case is so strong has to do with the supply and demand fundamentals and the current price of uranium, the cost to get it out of the ground, et cetera. But to answer your question on Kazakhstan, yes, they're in a very precarious situation right now. I think they're doing their best to walk a thin line um, they're a crucial source of uranium for China. About half the uranium that's mined in, in Kazakhstan goes to China. Um, and they have been pretty vocal about kind of planting their flag and remaining westerly friendly, um, you know, not supporting the war in Ukraine, essentially, as an ex-Soviet state. So they're really kind of in this in this difficult scenario. Um, you know, Cameco, for example, they're a miner in, in Saskatchewan. Uranium miner in Saskatchewan, they have a joint venture called the Inkai mine in Kazakhstan, fantastic mine. The Cameco gets about four to five million pounds a year from this mine. They have yet to get any uranium from that mine this year. Uh, and part of the reason has to do with shipping complications. Kazakhstan ships typically th through the port of, port of St. Petersburg, but they've been working on a westerly route to go through the Caspian, the Black Sea, and across uh, you know, that area and try to avoid shipping out of St. Petersburg. So there's a lot of um, complexities around this. And yes, they are an absolutely crucial source of uranium right now. Is there plenty of uranium in the world without Kazakhstan? Of course, but they are the low cost, reliable producer of the last decade and a half. So what happens there uh, means a lot to the, the uranium world and the nuclear fuel cycle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so many questions. I am getting to the opportunities here for investors in just a minute. Um, real quick, just because I know I'll get skewered if I don't ask this. Um, What's the potential you see right now for other non-uranium based fuel sources? One that gets talked a lot about on the internet is thorium. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of research out there trying to figure out fusion. Um, so as you look at, you know, your crystal ball of what folks are working on going forward, um, how much potential do you see for these non-uranium based fuels? Um, I mean, they've been working on fusion for a very long time. Um, they've yet to really get it nailed down. I think there's potential for fusion in the future. I think there's a lot of potential for thorium fuel. Um, but I think that we're talking 2030s plus for both, um, fusion, possibly even longer. But, uh, so the potential for either of these, uh, fusion or thorium to disrupt, let's say the bull market for uranium is basically zero. Okay. And, and let me just ask on, on fusion, um, I'm sure we could probably do a whole podcast just on fusion itself, but um, let's say fusion comes along and it, it gets commercially scaled. I mean, that's another big thing is one thing to do it in a lab. It's another thing to actually have a commercial reactor working. Um, but, but if, and when we get to that point, um, 
is that like so superior to the fission based uh, solutions that we should just replace everything fission based once we have fusion? I, I don't really know. Um, honestly, it looks, I mean, it's kind of like the holy grail of energy production if we can actually nail down fusion. So I think if that becomes commercially available and cost effective and functional on a commercial scale, we're talking 2040s, 2050s, I would say that's to be devoutly wished. Um, you know, if we can come up with uh, an abundant, clean, highly efficient source of energy, then I'm all for it. But um, it's not happening this decade, definitely. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's not not right into our rescue um, no. anytime in the next couple of decades. Okay. <clears throat> um, last big question as we transition into the investing opportunity. Um, it, it seems the world, for I think very good reasons, um, is desiring a, a post carbon energy future, right? Where we have these emissions free, green free, hopefully very environmentally friendly fuel sources. <clears throat> um, and uh, let me put it this way, the guys I know that I talk to who are in the fossil fuels base space, they want that too. They're just saying, look, we're not going to get there tomorrow. And Germany has sort of they're the poster child for learning that lesson. They moved too fast. They had sort of naive uh, optimism and they've gotten caught in, in the interim, right? Where the renewables aren't delivering nearly what they need. They now have a constraint on the fossil based supplies and they're they're in big trouble, right? Um, so globally, as we try to make this this move, um, and I think we should. I'm I'm definitely on board with it. Um, uh, how essential is nuclear energy to being a bridge, a bridge fuel to getting to that future? And it, it may actually be one of the. And it sounds like you're saying, hey, it, it may even be a big part of the final solution, but but helping us make that bridge from a, a fossil dependent energy system today to a fossil fuel independent one, how it, how essential is, is nuclear going to be? I guess, can we do it without nuclear energy? Well, I think, uh, um, short answer, no. Um, I, I really think it depends on um, what you're imagining as the ultimate place where we get to in terms of energy production. Um, and that can look like a lot of different things. So I would, I would ask then is nuclear is a bridge to what, I mean, if we're trying to get off of fossil fuels, let's say, and nuclear is a way to get there, what replaces nuclear, if nuclear is a bridge, what replaces nuclear? Because we know we can't run entirely off of, off of intermittent sources of energy. Um, you know, I mean, the conversation of energy of energy consumption reduction is not even on the table. All we're talking about is let's right. electrify everything as fast right. as possible without even discussing, you know, what is the strain on the lithium and the cobalt and the nickel, uh, you know, mines around the world? Is there even sufficient uh, nickel, cobalt, lithium, manganese on the planet to have grid scale battery systems to support intermittent renewables and is really that the world that we're looking at and, and and you know absolutely not we don't have the mining capacity to do that and that would be unbelievably environmentally destructive to do so anyways so i don't really know what nuclear would be bridging to in my opinion i think it's the answer i think that renewables have their place but i think that they the, the limit to the percentage of the grid needs to be calculated and thoroughly understood without just going all out renewables uh, blindly without understanding the consequences. And we're seeing the consequences of that in Germany is, is a perfect example. So renewables, I think, can make up a decent uh, minority percentage of a grid, but you have to be able to have either A, battery storage, or have baseload power that can easily cycle up and down. Now, some of these SMR designs, like the Natrium reactor that I mentioned, might be a perfect fit for, you know, alongside solar and wind. If you have a place where it's windy at night and you have solar panels and you have natrium reactors all part of the same grid, that might be an absolutely perfect combination. But it really depends on where that area is geographically and if it supports renewables to begin with. So I would say if nuclear is a bridge, what's, what is it bridging to? I don't really have the answer for that. I think if nuclear were discovered today, it would be hailed as humanity's saving grace. Um, it's clean, it's baseload. There's never been a problem with the waste. It's a long lived asset. Uh, I mean, it really ticks basically all of the boxes, 
the downsides, like you mentioned, with the build times and the upfront costs, that really has to do with where that's being built. Um, that's not a problem in China. It's not a problem in, in the Middle East. It's not a problem when the South Koreans are building it because they're so unbelievably brilliant and efficient. And uh, so it's, in my opinion, it, it is the answer. I don't think we can transition to a quote unquote green, quote unquote sustainable world with carbon free energy production, even looking out decades without nuclear. I just, I just don't see literally physically how it can be done. Okay. All right. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a declarative answer, which is what I was looking for. Um, and and you, you, you raise a really interesting point, which is if we just forget for a moment what we know and have been told about nuclear our whole lives, and if we just looked at it with a fresh pair of eyes, maybe it was called something else, and we're told, hey, scientists have just discovered this. We can do this going forward. World, do you want to? Yeah, the world probably would say, oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is the, the magic solution we've been waiting for, right? Uh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so sorry, did you, did you want to say something else? No, no, no. I just wanted, when you said reimagine, calling it something different, it made me think about uh, Josh Wolf. He's uh, super, super supportive of nuclear and he wants to rename it and call it elemental energy. And he's actually the one that says, you know, if this was discovered right now, everybody would be behind it and we're calling it the world's saving grace. So he's, you know, that, that terminology really came from Josh Wolf and he, he's trying hard to, uh, to, to have elemental energy catch on as the, the rebranding of nuclear. The rebranding, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, it very well may be a, a branding problem at this point. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, let's get to the key reason, you know, we've, we've been talking here now for over an hour. Um, thanks for giving me so much of your time. My pleasure. Yeah. And, uh, and now we're getting to the real meat of, okay, so why are we doing this on a show that's about, you know, investing? Um, uh, you wrote recently, uh, highly called out on your website, the following quote, the uranium, the uranium sector, in my opinion, offers the most asymmetric risk reward profile I've seen in my entire career. I believe that we are on the cusp of an enormous move in the sector. Um, all right. So you, you, you've told us why the technology makes so much sense here. Um, why are you so, uh, what are the specific reasons that you are bullish for, you know, the sector as an investment class to do so well going forward? Sure. Well, I think a lot of what we've talked about already. Our interview with Justin will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. And remember, we're continuing our new practice of publishing my top takeaways from these weekly interviews. To get mine from this interview with Justin for free, just go to wealthion.com slash Adam's Notes. Also, I just want to provide a quick reminder that Wealthion's upcoming fall conference is now less than three weeks away. If you missed out on our early bird price discount, which just expired this past weekend, you can still take advantage of our last chance to save 15% discount before tickets rise to full price soon. To lock that in, just go to Wealthion.com conference right now. And finally, if you're interested in investing in this space, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help develop a plan for you around the trends and opportunities Justin has mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our interview with Justin Hume.